All right, new acquisition. Uh, I found this on eBay for $99, and I've always wanted one. Even back in 1980, I wanted one of these. Um, maybe these come out in 1980. Maybe these came out in 1981. I'm trying to remember the date, but uh, yeah, these were these were all the rage. So this is a uh, old computer, and um, it made its fame in the early 80s as being the very first portable computer. And there we go. It's an Osborne One. Uh, it's lovely. So it doesn't work, which is good. <laughs> Although, um, so let me show you what happens when you turn it on. The switch is in the back, and unfortunately, and there's a, a door back there. I'll, you'll see it someday. So you turn it on, and it doesn't do nothing. It doesn't do nothing now. It goes whoop. So I think the power supply was about to go bad, and maybe it's the reefer caps or something went bad on it. Because when I first got it, and I turned it on, it just beeped. Beep! This is continuous tone. And um, so I noticed that the uh, return key was stuck all the way down. And I kind of pried it up and it didn't do anything. I tried to reboot it, it still went beep. So then I said, okay, well, I'll I'll remove the I'll remove the keyboard. So there's a there's a connector on the front that has the that has the keyboard. And so this is a unit. And when I disconnected the keyboard, it booted. And it came up with the normal boot screen that says put in a floppy. And I put in a floppy but then I needed the keyboard. So I plugged the keyboard back in and because I had released the key return key, I guess it worked. So I hit return and it gave me a disc error. So it came with two discs and I um, put the other disc in and hit return and it booted. And it booted into Microsoft Basic and I started to write a program and then it crashed and went beep again. And now I can't even turn it on anymore. And I think I maybe even heard of a capacitor pop. I'm, I'm not sure, but I, it seemed like it's made a strange noise in the back. Um, I don't think these have a fan. They have a, a, a louver on the top you're supposed to open up. I think it's convection cooled. So anyway, I think it's a power supply problem. Um, and obviously the keyboard needs to be rebuilt. Um, but the display works and it did boot once. So I know everything is good. Uh, it's just flaky. <laughs> so, um, I'll show you some history of the Osborne. You may, you, you may have already heard about it, especially my, my viewers who know about Vintage Computers. I'm sure they've heard a, a dozen people talk about Osborne's before, but uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit about them and then uh, we'll crack this thing open and see if we can't get it fixed. I think the first thing maybe to do is to, uh, to work on the keyboard and uh, get that working so, so I can use it. Here's Mr. Osborne. He was very proud of his new computer. It was released in 1981, April 3rd of 1981, at a cost of $1,795. And that sounds like a lot today, um, although, you know, laptops are in that price range already. But the reason that this was such a good deal is that not only did you get the computer, but it came bundled with software. Now, the reason that um, Adam Osborne was able to get the software cheap is he actually gave um, stock in the company, I believe, to the uh, people who wrote the software. So it came with WordStar, SuperCalc, CBasic, and MBasic. So CBasic was a compiled basic, and MBasic is an interpretive basic. Um, so it also came with DBase 2 later on, but not, not in the original re release, but it came with all those things. Um, but it ran CPM. It's a Z80 running at four megahertz, 64K of memory, although that's a bit of a lie and I'll show you about that. Um, it does have 64K memory. It definitely does. Uh, CPM 2.2, um, 
It had its own built-in display, a 5-inch CRT. It had two floppy drives. Um, the original ones were single density. I believe you could upgrade them to double density. And I'm a little bit... I, I think mine had been upgraded. One of the discs was marked double density, but it may have been formatted as single density. So uh, probably, I imagine it's probably just single density. But we'll have to crack it open to see. There was an add-on board that you, you had to put in. There was also another add-on board or a modification you could make to make the um, the display have more characters. It defaulted to something. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of remembering this off the top of my head. Something like 23 lines. Well, no, it's 24 lines, 52 characters. That's what it is. And you could extend it to 80 characters with some modification. Uh, so the um, computer had a front panel that had everything you needed. It had the two disk drives and the monitor in the middle. It had little cubbies uh, that you could put your uh, user manual in and your floppy disks and stuff in. There were people who eventually built, I think Osborne actually released a, a drive C that went in one of those cubby holes and people have hacked them nowadays to put uh, solid state drives in the, uh, in the, in those cubbies um, on the front panel, there was connectors for a serial port for a modem. Those are actually the exact same port. It's just that the connector for the modem is TTL and the connector for the serial port is plus or minus 12 volts or something. Uh, there's the keyboard uh, port on the front. They actually brought out an IEEE 48 bus to the front. I'm not quite sure why, and I don't know if anybody ever used it, but that was brought out. Uh, there's a reset switch in the front. And then on the on the very right-hand edge is a composite output for the display. So you could, you could put it in a big monitor. This is kind of a very small monitor, but it was portable, right? But you could put it in a big monitor if you, if you wanted to. So that's an introduction to my new computer, and obviously I'll be working on it and making videos of me uh, getting it going again.